get started. So I just want to welcome everyone to uh, Trade Shift. Um, so we're sponsoring this event. It's uh, Beyond Web Apps. So we're actually going to be discussing um, what you could do uh, beyond the web. So we're actually going to be talking about Firefox and Chrome Apps. And uh, we're doing this because we as a company believe that the web is a platform. Uh, and we would like to see it being pushed forward. Um, and so uh, with that, you know, uh, TradeShift is uh, kind of a small startup. Uh, we're, uh, the company actually started in Denmark. Uh, and we're actually looking for uh, front-end engineers, back-end engineers, and DevOps. So if you're interested, you can come talk to us. Uh, besides that, uh, we're actually going to get started. So the first presentation is going to be about Firefox OS. Uh, and we'll let it kick off. So I'm Chris. Uh, I came here from London, England. And I'm hoping this works now. Well, it should, if not, be recorded again. Um, I work for Mozilla for three years now. I'm the HTML5 spokesperson, and I'm teaching people about public speaking. So I help engineers talk to humans, and the other way around, and salespeople talk to non-buyers, and these kind of things. So um, I'm an engineer at heart. I've been a web developer for 15 years. I to build games on Commodore 64 and wild things like that. And then I found the internet and I was happy. Because out of a sudden, anybody can be a publisher. Anybody can be on the web. Anybody can be seen worldwide, 24-7. And it doesn't take much to be on the web. I mean, we laugh now at things like GeoCities, but back then it was like a big breakthrough. You know, it's like, if I'm a mom and pop shop that sells flowers, I could have a GeoCities page with 10,000 rotating ad signs, but I still had something that I didn't have before. Not a telephone number that people need to reach and these kind of things. So, I'm talking about Firefox OS, but uh, that's only part of it. Like, Firefox OS is an operating system, but it's also a change. It's a change in the mobile space that we wanted to make. And that's because we're Mozilla, we're a non-for-profit organization. Many people see us as a browser, but we are actually the people that are responsible that we have the internet of today. Because if nobody had stood up to a certain company with a blue E in 1997, 1998, we would have the internet only in offices, only in big corporations, and it would be one operating system that you have to pay for. And we said, like, man, it's open source. Why not? Like, why not give it out to the people and let's build a thing together? Firefox OS the same thing. We looked at the mobile space, we realized there's two players. There's Android, there's Google, there's Microsoft, there's Blackberry, there's others as well. But these were the big ones. And both of them were not open and were not based on the web. One of them was open based on Java, but it's more like not open source, but ta-da source. Like, ta-da, we're done, here's a new system, like, please help us fix bugs, and then, like, next version comes around. The other one is just closed which is good, they build great stuff. It's really simple to build something amazing if you control everything. If you control the hardware, the software, and the distribution, it's very simple to be awesome. It's much harder to be awesome if you have to compare everybody out there and make sure it works okay on a Linux box and on a Windows machine and so on and so forth. It's like comparing closed systems with open systems, it's like comparing a Formula One car with a, with a family carrier. Yeah, one of them is much faster than the other one, but try to park a Formula One car in San Francisco. It's a bit trickier. So Firefox OS is released in 14 countries. We are out in the market. People can go to the shop and buy Firefox OS phones. Spain, Poland, Venezuela, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, Mexico, Brazil, and others too. A lot of them in Eastern Europe are coming. Uh, Mobile World Congress is next week. I'm flying back tomorrow. There's going to be more announcements there. And you might see something there. These are not the countries that anybody else goes for. And this is why we did it. We wanted to bring mobile connectivity to the world, the mobile web to people that cannot afford it right now, that cannot access it, because that's unfair. It's the World Wide Web. There's a world thing in there. It's not like Silicon Valley Web or something like that. So we wanted to make sure we reach the countries where there's no mobile web yet. We released with seven mobile partners and three hardware partners. None of these are just sellers. None of these are just like, we bring your phones, you do everything. Every one of those has, has engineers on the product. So we've got like 10 engineers from Deutsche Telekom, 8 from Telenor, 12, 20 I think from, uh, from Telefonica. Everybody shares this and we can do it because it's open source. There's no secrets. And I love open source because I can't write bad code. I cannot hide it. 
because everybody sees immediately what I'm doing. So I have to make sure I write something good, and my God, people like to say you're wrong. It's very, very easy to get uh, bad feedback, but it's also quite interesting. Hardware options, there's hard Alcatel touch fires that TE open. They range from small ones to big ones, but they're all very, very affordable. That's what we wanted to do. We want to break the idea of the mobile app being a rich people <coughs> When an iPhone in Brazil costs you two month wage, that's not right. I don't need a certain hardware to reach the web. It's aimed at emerging markets, the low end market. So we also thought about people having a second hand phone. Like if a Firefox or S phone, you, you give it to your kid and it flushes it down the toilet, 100 euro are gone. Not like your credit card details and your $600 phone and all the things that go in there. And kids do that. It's aimed at alternatives to feature phones. So what we want to replace is the old phones where people can play Snake and do text messaging and these kind of things and give them something new, give them something better. The problem that we found with this is the better that we love doesn't necessarily mean the better for people like that. Where do you see feature phones right now? You see them in like people that don't have money, but you also see them in people like nurses at the airports, flight attendants, because an old Nokia 3110 you charge like every half a year or something. And that thing works. It's awful. It's not fun to work, but it really works. It's open source. All of this is on GitHub. Nothing in the core, nothing in the apps is not on GitHub and not available. That doesn't mean you have to open source your applications. But it means that the operating system itself can survive no matter what happens to Mozilla or our partners. And that's the cool thing about open source. You can't kill it. That's really, really nice. In Spain, like this one here, the Movistar offers the ZTE open for 69 euro, including 30 euro of balance for prepaid customers and a four gigabyte card. So for 39 euros, you have a phone that has your Facebook, has your Twitter, has your Instagram-ish things, because Instagram itself hasn't built an HTML5 version yet, but has all the things that we think are cool as well and we're using. I live in London, and London is a wonderful place. It's actually, this was in the Museum of London, it's 50 resident communities of over 10,000 people from 33 different nations. 300 languages spoken and 14 different faiths practiced in one city. My whole neighborhood is Jewish on one side, Algerian on the other, Turkish on the other. And I'm the German-British guy in the middle. And everything works. Nobody burns each other. Nobody shouts at each other for having a different faith because we have to, we have to survive in the city together. And it's wonderful to see these experiences. A friend of mine is a kid, and he just moved from London out to the countryside, as you do, because it's much more, much cheaper. And his kid was complaining that all of a sudden all the other kids in the school are white. <laughs> like they, they don't bring the cool food that the other kids brought around, and they don't bring the like they don't talk about their church and stuff. It's really, really nice to see integration work. And I think there's nothing more exciting than, than traveling and being somewhere else that you don't, first of all, understand and then start to understand after a while. I lived in India for a while. It's a shock to the system. You cannot prepare for it. But it's wonderful once you've done it. This is a shop in my neighborhood. And we're in, Ling we're in England. Like, we're a rich country. We have this Doctor Who money, that sterling British pound. But this is my neighborhood with the Turkish part of it. Like, all these phones are still being sold. These little feature phones, these things that people have. And we should not forget that this is the world out there. In India, in Africa, nobody has a contract for their phone. They go into a phone store, they buy a phone, they buy a SIM card and put it in. So whatever the shop has at that month is the phone that they will get. It's not that they're actually getting free upgrades for phones like that. This is hardware, it's being built and it's being used. And if it doesn't die, then people use it for months and months. So when it comes to uh, building an operating system for the worldwide use and for re replacing feature phones, we needed to think about different things than others do. Like right now, the other mobile market is like, how big can our phone be? How high is the resolution? 3D sounds, projections, and like if you've got blemishes on your skin, it automatically changes them when you take photos or something like that. In our case, it was like, how is the battery life? That's like in rural India, I can charge my phone like every 12 hours or so. So I cannot have a phone that dies halfway through. So make sure that whatever we do in HTML5 is actually not eating the battery. Find these things. And that's why we invented things like request animation frame. Because we realized that timeouts eat the battery brutally. We, have, we invented things like CSS animation hardware accelerated rather than just there. 
So Chrome and Firefox both work together on these things because we had that need, not because we thought it's a good idea. Because we heard from people, we went for like seven months in different markets and asked people what they use their phone for and how they use it. And this is so insightful, it's wonderful, it's also so liberating because you have like a two-year-old Android phone and you're like, I don't need to upgrade yet, I'm still cool. I'm still one of the cool kids. Connectivity is a massive, massive thing, of course. I mean, uh, the, the being on the phone, you're always offline. You're on some train, you're in some elevator, you're, uh, you're basically in some hole where you cannot get connections. And even at home, connections can be terrible. This is my brother's connection in Germany. Like 45 megabyte per second, 12 megabyte, 0.12 up. That's a 10 megabyte connection. This is all he gets in our village. So he pays a lot of money for a connection he doesn't get. I've got a 25 in London for 10 pound a month. And in my Swedish flat, I got 100 megabit up and down because the government sponsors it. But if you build an app now, no matter what platform, <coughs> make that thing work offline. Otherwise, you have not an app. Otherwise, you make crap. I'm sorry. The thing has to do something offline. Otherwise, why do we package it as an app? We might as well have it as a website. It doesn't make any sense to have an app that doesn't do anything when I cannot be connected, like on a plane, like somewhere else. Good thing in America, you don't have much choice. I mean, like the whole Comcast thing. Like, that's one provider now, so it's much easier. <laughs> the other problem that we have with people is that even if I get an iPhone in Brazil, even when I get an iPhone in Africa, I don't get content for it. Because I'm blocked out. My country doesn't have any money, sorry. Like, you cannot access the iTunes store. You cannot get any content that is relevant. How do I get an app that makes me, for example, find water holes in Africa into the iPhone store? It's not going to get through. People try it because it's not worth it. It's not enough people downloading that. It's not enough people making it. And this is just frustrating because to me, as a web developer, that's the web. I put it there, you reach it from wherever. It might take you hours to download, but you can get to it. Making geofencing on the web is just moronic to me. I'm sorry. This is just 1980s, 1970s contract put into a high-speed new environment. Payment is another big issue. A lot of people in the third world countries or in emerging markets don't have credit cards. I've got an English credit card with lots of pounds on it. Can I get petrol here when I have a rental car? No, I don't, because my postcode is N42XX and you have to put in a zip code to get petrol. So I have to go into the petrol station and get to give them cash or get some money out of the cash point, which looks like the, the, the science console of Dr. Spock here. <laughs> and this just drives me nuts. So we need to find a way how we can worldwide sell apps and how people can make money with apps worldwide. And the answer is carrier billing. If you have a phone, you have a SIM card, you pay for that SIM card. So when you buy apps, you get that money on that SIM card. So it comes at the end of the month at your contract, or you can buy a SIM card with so and so much money on it, and then your kids can buy apps for only so and so much money, and you don't get the $12,000 contract out of a sudden, or the bill from Apple that like, what did you do? Oh, I played Candy Crush. The other thing is publication. If I want to be a publisher on the web, as I said, I open a website, people in China can see it sometimes, people in North Korea can see it, people in Africa, people everywhere can go there. As a publisher, I want to do things, but if I hear you pay $99 and you need to have an American account to become a publisher or a UK account to become a publisher, I'm shot. I can't make my business. I can't come up with something relevant to the country that I'm in. And this is why we, we said, okay, the web is the platform. We don't close it in. We don't make it a thing that you have to be paid to play, so to say. It doesn't make sense to me. In America, it's all the bands like, you pay the venue to have a concert. What? Like in England, we get paid for playing, and that it's the venue's problem to get people in. And people are busy with other things. This was one of my favorite pull requests lately. It's like, I will take a look later, much, much later, because I'm Ukrainian and we have a revolution right now, sorry. <laughs> So I can't look at your pull request of my code because there's people outside killing each other. And people are busy with other things, but they could make a little app to make some money on the side, to talk about their public transport, to show people how to get from one city to another easier. If you buy an iPhone for a lot of money, you connect to it, you find somebody in America who has a credit card to get things for it, it's very frustrating to open it and then see like a blank spot that, you, that your city doesn't exist on the map. A local map, OSM maps, things like that, much, much better. So we have a few like, 
walking apps for Serbian countryside. This thing would not go into the Apple Store. This thing would probably be in the Play Store, but it would be hard to find. But publish, publishing in Serbia, together with the biggest Serbian telecom company, made that app maker a lot of money and made him successful in his country as well. The press came to him like, dude, you got mobile phones now, awesome. And you find these really weird things that people want. Like we, did, we went to Brazil and we asked people, yeah, so mobile phone, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? What do you need? Can it play radio? Was one of the biggest requests. Everybody listens to radio on their phone. They don't listen to MP3s that they bought, they listen to radio which is something I hadn't seen since the 80s when we had these cool headphones with like little radios inside that now look really silly. But because of these requests and because of knowing what people want, we built APIs to make that available. There's a web radio API. Every phone has an FM transmitter in there. You can listen to radio on every phone, it's just not turned on in most of them. It's actually part of the networking stack and necessary for the phones. That's why you can do like, uh, like ultrasound data connectivity as well. So HTML5 and the web gave us all of that, gave us all the answers to that already. It's a inbuilt distribution, it's the web. It's simple technologies used by lots of developers. HTML, CSS and JavaScript is not magic. It's very simple. We make it very hard nowadays by putting it into like 15 different libraries and like telling people you need to learn Unix for before, before you do CSS. But it's not hard. It's hard to do it right, but it's not hard to do the first steps. It's evolution of existing practices. We got 15 years experience in enterprise, in e-commerce, in CMS. We, we know the web. We, we've done it. It's there and we've used it. And it's open, independent and standardized. Not one company owns the web. And that, till my dying day, I will defend that that doesn't happen. And Mozilla does the same thing. That's why we're here. We had promises of HTML5. When the first iPhone came out, Steve Jobs went on stage and said there's no SDK required. Safari is the best browser on the planet, debatable, but he said that. And it does everything that you need. A tell URL with called Tyler. A map URL will open up the maps. We made everything HTML5 because it's easy to use. That changed rather quickly. And sadly enough, it didn't change much. This is uh, canIuse.com. CanIuse.com uh, tells me what I can use in different browsers. And when it's red, it's bad. So you see the Android browser, iOS Safari, and Opera Mini is totally red in a lot of things. A lot of the standards of HTML5, the basic ones like form validation, are not available in mobile browsers that come with the mobile operating systems that are closed or semi-open. They also don't really um, support performance that well. A web, a web view is great, but it's never as fast as a native app. I would say by design, but that would be the cynic in me. But it's just sad that we basically have to jump through hoops to make something work in open technologies when we could use the technology that you have to be a 99 developer for and download a 5 gig SDK before you start developing, which if I'm in Algeria would take me three days before I actually get my first line of code written. You shouldn't have to ask for being allowed to do something, and we shouldn't have to ask to be able to get a certain app. Every few months there's a new iOS app that everybody needs. Then as an Android user, I have to wait five months till somebody's happy enough to port it there as well. I remember when Instagram came out for Android, there was this big outrage in iOS users like, oh, Android cameras are so bad, so now Instagram will lose all its quality. And, and I was tweeting like, yeah, now you have to look at what poor people eat. Because it's like, this is what people do, they just take pictures of their food. This is the Frankfurt Airport, and it has this restaurant called Ask for Delicious Pizza. And you're like, what if I don't? What do I get? <laughs> do I get like the shitty pizza, the one from yesterday? Like, do you have to ask for delicious? No, delicious is there. It's the same with app development. Nobody goes out there and says like, I want to have something nourishing. We go out like, I want to have something good. And the same should be with your app development. You don't make something nourishing, you make something good. You make something that people want because you put your efforts in, you want to do it. Redundancy is a big, big thing. This is a rental car I get in America where I have two keys, two remote controls to open the door and sound the alarm in case I forgot to run a traffic light again or in the parking lot, I don't know what my car looks like because I'm so tired. And it's on a ring that I can't open. So I've got two sets of keys that are together the size of a European car and I really cannot do anything with them. 
Why do you put that on one ring and not understand? And the same is to me our marketplaces. The same to me our closed systems. They're redundant. We have the internet. We have HTTP, which has all its problems. But it connects computers worldwide. They've done it for 15 years. I don't have to go through another market, log in before I can play. That's just to me, step back. I don't buy software on CDs any longer, get them mailed to my house, put them in my computer and install them. But an app is more or less the same thing. If I have to download 15 meg for a new, uh, new level in a game that is just like a few K, that's just not right to me. That's a step back in, in distribution. And actually, if you look at the apps that are hot right now, people are rebelling already. People don't want these like really shiny, cool, massive apps that do everything awesome. Flappy Bird was a success because it looked shit. It was a success because it was hard to play, it was completely different to the things that other people see, and it was just like, there was no fairness in that. There was no like, okay, you can buy now a, a new level that makes it easier to you. It was like Pac-Man. Pac-Man didn't get easier, it just got harder and harder and harder. And that what made it interesting for us to play. Snapchat as well, it's like, what is this Snapchat? It's like ICQ. It's like a chat system, for Christ's sake. There's nothing new in that thing. But people love it. Like when I gave my family uh, uh, Firefox or S devices for Christmas, my godson, the first thing is like, okay, I got Snapchat. <laughs> really? Like, I give this thing with WebGL and like real 3D animation and cool music, and he just starts typing to people that he knows. You're like, awesome, okay. That makes, actually makes me happy to a degree. So, we had a lot of HTML5 issues that we wanted to fix with Firefox OS, and now I'm going through all the things what we've done there, so it's code coming, sorry, but just a few lines of code. So, tablet is coming as well, man, whatever. So here's the architecture. We have Linux, Gonk, ADB enabled. This is the same core as Android. So why should we reinvent the wheel when it's already there in open source? That part of Android is completely open, so fair enough. Then we put the Gecko rendering engine on top of that. That's the rendering engine that's inside Firefox. We put web APIs and web activities on top of that. I will talk about that in a second. Gaia is the interface of the operating system, the desktop, the, the apps that come with it, the dialer, the, the uh, desktop machine, the photo app, and third-party HTML5 applications. All of this, HTML5. JavaScript, CSS, HTML, nothing else. You don't need to learn Java, you don't need to learn C++, you don't need to learn Pascal, uh, uh, Lua, or whatever. You actually just write it in the things that you write the web with. In essence, it's Android without Java plus Firefox, and that's Firefox OS. Simple as that. It's predictable HTML5 support because the operating system is the browser, and not the browser is the red-headed stepchild of the operating system like in other systems. If Firefox doesn't update, then we have a problem. All the, a lot of the benefits of Firefox in the latest editions came from Firefox OS because we targeted these things, not the quad-core, high-end, high-resolution things. We wanted to make these things work as fast as these things, and this is how we learn. Security, of course, is a big issue. JavaScript has this problem that whatever is on the same domain has full access to everything. So if I manage to get some injection point into your website, which could be an image, which could be an ad, which could be anything that we put in there, I can steal your cookies and go nuts. And that's a big problem of the web. So we had two ways of doing that. The first one is in every browser, this is actually a Chrome screenshot, I think, um, Ask the user every single time if they want to do it. Do you want to give us your location? Do you want to actually do something as links? Do you want to access the camera? Do you want to do things? This is just annoying and there's no much enough space there. So we had to find a way to actually make apps, not websites. And we've done that by defining a manifest. Manifest file is a JSON object that just tells you my app is this name, this description, here's the icons, I am the developer of it, Installs are allowed from a certain domain or from everywhere, and I'm going to come back to that. The app cache path is basically here's my app cache, and the locales are English, French, Italian, whatever I want to put in there. And then you can also define what you want to do. Do you want to go full screen? Do you want to use more local storage? All the things that you ask for as an app developer. The end user then, when they install the app, they will be asked about these things on installation time, and not every single time they do it. A big difference in the security model is as well is that it's not rigid. 
So you can do it later on on demand as well. So if your app out of a sudden needs camera access in a new level, you don't have to reinstall it. You can ask the user at that time, do you want to have access now? Okay, then you have access. So that's a big thing as well, because a lot of apps actually ask for far too much uh, access to the hardware up front, although they don't need it. Like, and people just get so tainted with it, like, yeah, a puzzle game, of course it needs access to everything, I want to play the game, and then they wonder why in the background it's starting to call telephone numbers, they cost a lot of money. This is how malware starts, because people get tired of saying yes and no to things. So, we have web content, that is regular web content, that's your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on your server, which is a website. This one has access to a few APIs, it can be full screen, it actually can have app cache, have local storage. There's a great library we wrote for Firefox OS called a Local Forage, which you can use everywhere on the desktop now as well, which wraps local storage into IndexedDB, so you don't have the performance issues of local storage. We have installed web applications. These are applications that need to be packaged up with a manifest file and zipped up and can be installed in one go. We've got privileged web applications that get access to more things. And we've got certified web applications, which are device-critical applications. Certified web apps are only built by Firefox and partners, uh, by Mozilla and partners, because these are really the things that have access to text messages, the things you don't want anybody else to get access to. Privileged web applications just go through a security review and a content review before they're being published. App permissions are defined on the wiki, and the URL isn't there, but I'm sending this out later with all the links. And what you ask for is the permissions. So contacts, I want to require for auto-completion on the share screen. Read, create to contacts, I want to have access to the alarms, required to share your notifications. So we don't just allow you to ask for it, but you also have to give a reason. Why do you ask for it? And if your app uses it to a different reason than the one that you defined, it's not going to go through the security review, because you don't lie to us. What are web APIs? Web APIs are open specifications on accessing the hardware, because these things become cool because you can do the things you can't do on desktop. You have an accelerometer, you have a camera, you got access to a vibration API, all the things that you want to make a phone to do. And on the web, we never had access to that. It was just not defined in HTML5, and nobody thought of it. So we came up with a whole set of APIs, together with the W3C, with the What Working Group, to get you access to all these things in a JavaScript way. So vibration API, geolocation is one of the oldest. That was in, in Firefox 3.5, actually. WebFM API is the radio one that I talked about. And they all work similar. Battery status API, as I said, people are very excited about battery life. So if you in your app could read how much battery there is left, and then maybe turn off some animations or turn off some background polling to make sure your application doesn't suck much battery, that's great, right? It's called Navigator Battery, and it has a few settings like uh, battery level, battery charging, and it has events that get fired when something changes. So you can actually read and write fully and not write to the battery. You can't charge it from JavaScript. That would be awesome. <laughs> but you can't. But you can just read out what the battery status is. That works on desktop, that works on Opera, that works on Chrome now as well. So these are all things that are open for every platform. That's why we do them to W3C and not just for ourselves. Vibration API, which used to be called the Vibrator API, but there were too many stupid jokes about this. That's why we call it Vibration API. <laughs> Navigator Vibrate 1000. Vibrate the phone for a doubt for one second. Or you give it an array, vibrate, stop, vibrate, stop, vibrate, stop. Of course, what do engineers do once we had this? Make a Morse coding thing, like that your phone vibrates and another one records it on the, uh, on the uh, well, wait, we don't have much time. <laughs> <laughs> Network information API. Is the thing currently connected? Do we have connection? Can I pull some new data? Or do I just tell the user, okay, there's no data left right now? Is the bandwidth uh, high, is it low, is it, uh, is it wireless, is it 3G, is it 4G, is it 2G, and is it meter? Meter is a big thing. In, a, in most countries where we release Firefox OS, you pay per megabyte. And you pay up front, like I want to have 2 gigabyte or something like that. I guess it's here as well. In England, I don't have that. But um, we build an application together with Telefonica. The Telefonica guys actually came up with it that gives you full access to the phone and tells you what, how much you've used and how much more traffic you've got left, and you get alarms when there's something going there. That may allows people to use apps accordingly. Page visibility is simply saying an event listener and visibility change, and if the document is hidden, the document is currently not active. So don't go pulling things. Don't try to do things. That also works with uh, tabs. 
So in, in both Firefox and in Chrome, if you have a tab in the background, then you can read out that way if somebody is reading your app or not. So you can put a title there, please come back, I'm missing you, or something like that. Push notifications is a big thing that was a pain to get right. And we're still halfway there. Uh, and it's people from Google, people from Intel, people from Mozilla working together. Push notifications means I wake up your phone. Your phone is basically lying there. I got a new update for my app, and I want to make it. I want to wake it up and get information there. So you re register a message handler, push register, and say like, "Oh, my server is actually here." That one goes to the Mozilla server, does all the security checking and the, the uh, uh, like handshakes, and then says like, "Okay, here's your server connection for this phone for this session." After that, Mozilla is not involved any longer. No, none of the data goes through our servers. We just do the authentication, which is very important because you don't want your app to go through another server other than the NSA that you can't control to actually try to actually read stuff from you. The push notification handler is the same thing. I got a notification and then I do things with my own server. So very simple, very way of doing it. It's a security nightmare to get this right, but we managed to do it and other people are implementing that one as well now. Because that's a big thing. You don't want your app to run all the time and pull and ask. Because that costs battery, that costs that makes your phone hot. That's not nice. So a push notification only tells you when there's something new and then wakes up the phone. That makes it much, much easier for battery life. Privileged apps have device storage, browser API. You can build your own browser inside an app if you want to. It's a bit like a web view, except it's like full access. TCP socket for chat things, contact APIs, system XHR in case you need to load data from the web. Contacts API is a demo. Create a new contact, new most contact, name Tom, and you have an on success and an on error handler for that, and that's how easy it is to create a new uh, a new contact on the phone. Reading the content, the contact is limited, but uh, you can request full access if it's actually hosted. Certified apps get the rest. Web telephony, do telephone calls, send text messages, change the settings, power management, mobile connection, and so on and so forth. These are the OS apps, the operating system applications. These are all HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript. Nothing in there is something else. If you want to learn how they're built, look at GitHub. Look at the source code there, they're all there. Dialer, contact, camera, notes, first run experience. That also allows you as a phone provider to build a different home screen, simply by writing an HTML page. And that was, of course, very interesting for people that get very locked out by other providers. Web activities are a way to actually make an ecosystem of applications in your operating system. So it's a bit like web intents, uh, <laughs> like Android intents, like web intents were. Um, it allows you to say, my app is the one for camera access. And the user that says, like, okay, this is mine for camera access, and every time another app accesses the camera, it fires up your application. It's a bit like right-click, open with, and right-click, open always with on the desktop. It also allows you to tap into functionality of other applications that you don't have to do. So for example, access to the camera is limited. We cannot allow any website to access the camera without asking the user. But people have a camera app. So what you do is you ask for an image. And then it says, do you want to get the image from the wallpaper, from the gallery, or from the camera? These are all three applications that registered themselves as being the handlers for images. My code is just mod activity pick, type image PNG, image JPEG, image JPEG, and there's a copy error in there. And then you got an on success handler and an on error handler, and that's about it. So you don't need to ask the user for access to the camera. You just ask the user for an image, and they do whatever they want to get an image into your app. And I like that. I don't want to have access to your address book in my application, because if I get hacked, I lose that. I keep it in your control. I don't care which app you use. And this is what most activities or what web activities do. Again, a proposal for other browsers to implement as well. App distribution. How do I get found? How do I actually get my app out there? Of course, we got a marketplace. Everybody has a marketplace. People love marketplaces. Until in two years' time when people don't like them any longer and realize it's actually a rather stupid idea. But right now, we have a marketplace where we have our reviews, we have our um, ratings, we have all the things that you have there. You upload your images, your videos, you get people to feedback and everything there. But you don't need it. And guess what? The marketplace is an HTML5 application. The source code is available. 
So if you want to build your own R marketplace, a mobile phone provider, for example, you can. Probably a stupid idea to have more than one marketplace on a phone, but if you want to make that mistake, go for it. If you just want to install an application, here is the five lines of JavaScript to do that as well. So this could be an event handler on a button that says like, okay, install app, point to the manifest, and then install it or an error, don't install it. That works on desktop, that works on Android, that works on Firefox OS for open web apps. That's why it's called open web apps and not Firefox OS apps. Works on every nice open platform, Linux, Windows, OS X, IO, in the other three. As the apps are HTML5, they're searchable, much like any other website is searchable. So instead of having to know the name of an application, I can enter the name of a band and it shows me music apps and ticket apps and information about bands. If I put the name of a recipe in there, I get cooking apps. If I put the name of a movie in there, I get movie apps. These are localized. If I'm in Brazil and I enter football, I get the sport and not the rugby in two lines that cause concussions that you have here. This is where my local apps will come will be found by people. This is where it gets really interesting because I never understood that I have to know the name of an app. I never understood as an app developer I have to spend a lot of money on marketing to get people to know what my application does. In this case, you could list as the, as the biggest app out there without any advertising. Something like Flappy Bird managed to do by using Twitter and Facebook. But this could be in the search in the phone itself. And these are all try before you buy. So these are just HTML5 apps that run right now, that load in a few K, not in like the 50 meg that you need to download. You play with the app, you like it, you install it. You don't like it, you discard it. Much like we use the web. Why do I need a weather app? I go to Google and I say like, weather San Francisco. And I get a small page telling me what it is, like 5K of loading, rather than like installing 50 meg. It comes with the operating system as well. It's like the people that install birthday apps on Facebook. You know that. Facebook tells you about birthdays, right? Like, why is there another app for that? It fascinates me. Development environment, how do I develop for it? Well, the browser displays it, so why should the browser not be the development environment? Chrome understands that, Safari understood that, Internet Explorer understands that, and we of course as well. So here's a little video explaining what that does. So that's the app manager. Uh, this is the next Australis Firefox, how it will look like with the rounded corners. The app manager allows you to connect a phone with USB. So I could do that live right now, but the demo gods will probably not be with me. And I connect the phone, I connect to the phone. I have to say on the phone as well that I want to connect, so you cannot connect to somebody else's phone. And then I just in import the app. I can go to a URL with a manifest, and I can actually go to my own hard drive and package and go there. Once I have it, I just update, and that installs the app on my phone itself. And then I can start playing with it. I can install both apps, and the web developer tools that you use to debug websites also debug the apps, or even packaged apps. So I can now say debug here in this application, and I get the developer tools. So I get the HTML, and I can rename things. I can shift things around. I can actually see how the app is being created. And I can easily fix things without having to go through another packaging process, sending it to the marketplace, hoping people like it, hoping what's going on. So I can click on the phone as well itself to actually select things in the HTML, much that I can actually on the desktop. I can mess with the CSS. If out of a sudden I want to have a border around these buttons, I can just put a border in there and try that out. So for prototyping the next version of your, AP, of your app, that's wonderful, because you can see the problems directly on the phone, and you can find out what's going there. You have a debugging in JavaScript. You can set your debugging points. You can actually find out where the, uh, where the, the memory goes. You have full access to the app. So this is the home screen of, uh, HTML, uh, of Firefox 1.3. But I can now go into that design and actually completely mess around with it. So I can say instead of the var uh, a variable here, a CSS variable, which is now in CSS as well. You don't need any preprocessor for that. All of a sudden, I make the icons round. I put a, a white border around it. I play with it. And that's the, the experience when I would start the phone. So this is the desktop itself. It's like styling the start bar in, Fire, uh, in Windows, or star, styling the dock in OS X, which you, of course, are not allowed. But as everything is HTML5, I can easily play around with that and debug it. The browser is the way to consume, but also the way to create. 
this is good because people download that thing once and it might take them ages to get it. So why should they have to go for another SDK and do other things there? So you can resize the icons with a bit of CSS. You can then save it back to your hard drive, package it up again, send it back into Marketplace, and you're done. You can even rotate the icons if you want to. Don't know why we did that, but fair enough. <laughs> There's a great app called Firefox OS Boilerplate app, which has buttons for everything that Firefox OS can do. So these are all the, um, the web activities. You can download that one, play with it, remove the buttons you don't need, put your own buttons in, make millions. As simple as that, maybe. Prototype with JS Fiddle. If you use JS Fiddle already to play around with it, please use it. It's the best thing ever, or, or Dablet, or CodePen.io. There's nothing better than putting code out there and letting people play with it. JS Fiddle now also has uh, um, Together JS in it, so you can actually press a button and have an audio chat with people while you're actually coding together. Great for job interviews. Really, really good because you can see people while they're doing something and explaining why they're doing it. So in JS Fiddle, all you have to do is a slash web app manifest to the end of the URL to create a manifest and slash foxhtml to install this application as a Firefox OS app and try it out on your phone. That way you can just mess around, you go to Stack Overflow, get people to tell you what to do and other people to tell you to do something different and one or two people trying to help you. And then you can actually build your app that way. Building blocks, the big thing people ask for, like, ooh, where can I start? Where do I get my bootstrap for Firefox OS? We didn't make any, because we wanted you to have the choice. But we realized by now we need to make any. People don't do that anymore. So that's buildingfirefoxos.com, which is the building blocks of the operating system itself, with the source code and explanations why it is the way it is. There's Mozilla Brick, which is a very small, small JavaScript library that actually is a web components library. So as soon as web components will get into browsers, don't have to do anything else, it's done. It works that way. So if you want to have, for example, a flip box, all you have to do is X flip box, and the front face, and the back face, and a toggle button to shift them around. The difference here in web components, and I could talk about web components for hours because I love them, is we don't work against the browser. This animation works while the browser is painting the screen already. It's not the browser is painting the screen, and then we have to make sure we don't interfere with it. We can build widgets with web components that are part of the browser, much like a Dropbox now, where a select element would create a Dropbox. And that's really, really important that we go to this. And I hope that every browser will more and more support that, because I'm tired of working against the browser. And I worked in Yahoo and other people. We had a lot of this stuff in the years. So what's cooking? What's next? Cordova implementation APIs are a thing that's going to be, I guess, announced next week or something like that. I don't know if I'm violating some terms and conditions right now, so fuck it. <laughs> so Cordova is basically PhoneGap. It's uh, what everybody uses to build HTML5 apps for Android and iOS. And Firefox OS is just another way of building apps from, from uh, PhoneGap now. It's a bit weird, because PhoneGap is there to make HTML5 into native code. So with Firefox OS, we make native code into native code. But if you're already going the Cordova way, probably a bad idea to tell you to do something else. That's why we actually went with them. And they're great guys. Brian LaRue is a good friend of mine. They're awesome. So camera, context, device, device motion, geolocation, orientation, vibration, all of those are implemented. You in PM install Cordova, you create a hello comic sample, hello world, go into the folder, add platforms, add Firefox OS, prepare Firefox OS, done. Send it to the marketplace, make millions in markets where you're not right now. Camera API looks like this. Camera, get picture, function source, get an image, and that's basically that. So that's much simpler than going through the web, uh, web activities because it stays in the same application. More web APIs are coming. UDB, peer-to-peer -peer API, web NFC, web USB. And we have an app maker for kitten apps. That's basically uh, uh, what you see is what you get editor, where every single control that you drag in is a web component in itself that's targeted at mom and dad users that want to build an app. It's not for professionals, it's like the what you see is what you get Dreamweaver style thing for building apps. Take a look at that thing, it's amazing, and please bug them to make that more professional for professional users as well, because for me, this is the perfect blueprinting tool for apps. Why should I start from scratch every single time when I could drag and drop a thing together and make my app with a few clicks of a button? The developer hub is where you get all the information that you need how to design a good HTML5 app, the design principles behind HTML5 and Firefox OS, how to build your app, how to publish your app. 
There's Mozilla Developer Blog, which I'm one of the writers of, uh, where there's a Firefox category which has like weekly things on Firefox OS. There's a video series where they put me next to unfortunate people that got interviewed by me and talked about different things about the Firefox OS system. Oh god, the cameraman on this one was so... He's like, you know, switching between him and you all the time, like the light of my camera was just absolutely annoying. It's just wonderful. There's a wiki that tells you everything about Firefox OS. Not only about HTML5, but also if you want to be part of the operating system and build part of the core. Like help us with NFC, help us with USB. We, this is all like C++, Linux stuff, and also JavaScript in terms of Gaia. And to wrap up, there's a friend of mine, Penelope Pickles, she's in Canada. Awesome, awesome lady of the internet. Nothing is wasted. You don't have to buy into Firefox OS. You don't have to tell me like, ooh, I'm going to build Firefox OS only right now. What you build for Firefox OS goes into HTML5, goes on every platform out there with Cordova, with other platforms. You don't do anything that is only for us. You can, but like that. Actually, I don't care. I actually like it if you build for everybody. But, H but Firefox OS is the only platform that's completely open and supports the dreams that basically Steve Jobs had when he talked about there's no SDK for HTML5. This is a list of applications that we're actually talking about at Mobile World Congress that came from other platforms, that were written for other platforms and then just converted for Firefox OS. And the blog post in the, in the bottom tells you basically what people have to do to convert them to Firefox OS, and it's never more than a two or three day process, because it is just going back to the web, what we've done already. And that's all I had, so thanks very much. Are we on time? We've got a question. Yeah. Yeah, so you briefly mentioned the uh, operator billing component, but in the rest of the presentation, you didn't actually go into any of the aspects of monetization. So I was wondering maybe you could say a couple of words about actually, you know, you've you said a bunch of times, oh, make lots of money, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, monetization model is exactly the same as in other marketplaces as well. I mean, as I said, you can do your own distribution, then you can do your own uh, uh, your own uh, uh, monetization as well, which is actually quite good for somebody who has, for example, a news page. Uh, an already existing website, they want to turn into an app, all they have to do is put a manifest file and use the traffic that they're getting already for people to install their app. Uh, with the marketplace listings, we've got a 70-30 split, like all the other marketplaces as well, of the money coming in. And uh, we have APIs for, monetize, uh, for making payments, and a web payment API, which is an open API, and an in-app payment as well. You can choose your own provider. You don't have to use Mozilla to actually uh, do it. You can do it with, with uh, uh, Bango is one big one that we're partnering with. Um, PayPal is another one. So the system is, again, it's the same as like with the push notifications. We just do the encryption and the validation of the payment. The payment provider is something that you can pick for yourself. And that's basically the monetization model there. Nothing different to others except for we don't take the lion's share and we don't basically lock you out for uh, in certain markets. And as we partner with Bango, it's not only sellable in certain markets, but actually worldwide. Hope that answers the question. I actually used to work for Bango, so that's why I was trying to set <laughs> you up. Oh, nice. So what did you do that you don't work there anymore? I was the local rep. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. So uh, this is actually the emulator here as well. So if you um, if you just want to see, you don't need a phone because the phones are actually sold on eBay. You can get them, yes, but you can actually just use the simulator. If I click Start Simulator here, I can pick which version of Firefox OS it connects. It gives me a phone on my computer, and then I can do all the things that I can normally do with a nice app. Maybe it's a bit smaller here, and. For example, here I've got this to-do app. Let's uh, uninstall this one. I'm clicking along here, the awesome to-do app. Clicking this one along. And I always like them when they're like, oh, don't delete me, don't delete me. <laughs> I've got the power. <laughs> so now I can say add a pa packaged app. And all I have to do is go to my hard drive, go to my htdocs folder here. Um, where is it? Firefox OS something. Video script, to-do app. Finish. Open this one. 
It packages up automatically, creates a zip file for me. There's a manifest file in there so it knows which files to put in. And then I can start update and the application has been installed on my phone. I can double click it and I've got a great to-do app. And then I can basically go into like debugging here and look at the HTML of my, uh, of my app. And I can rename the header from to-do to, for example, to Toto. And out of a sudden it becomes much more important in Kansas. And I've got my Toto app. I can change the style. I can change the box model. I find all the CSS that has been applied to it. So I change the background color here to another color. So you can mess around with the apps in the device until you have it. And I've done that, for example, uh, if you have been outside of our office here, which is just down the road, there's this monument um, that shows all the people that worked on, um, on Firefox or on, with Mozilla in the past. So I've got this Mozilla, no, that's not the strong one. Yeah, this is what it looks like to a degree. And you can basically put in your name and you find where on the application you are. And I created that thing on a flight, offline, in the browser, and managed to actually put it on my server and install it on Firefox OS devices within two hours because it's just HTML. And everything I did in that simulator without going in a, in a phone and connected on the plane because that might have gotten the flight attendant towards me that I'm building a bomb or something like that. But all I had to do was the emulator. My browser is my space where I build things and is my space where I serve things. And that's the way it should be to me. So if there's no more questions, I guess we have to move on. Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Sandeep. So we do some work, uh, ICT work in developing countries. So it's really great to see you focusing that part. So um, my question is, how are you choosing the carriers to work with? Right? So this is great that you can build apps in this environment. But the challenge of distribution, getting the phone, especially the carriers to work with you, where they're not very cooperative, whatever. So do you have any thoughts like how you select carriers and how, how, what's the like quickest path to getting some of these apps out in those places? Well, carriers come up to us. Uh, there was actually a big map, there was a big gap in the market because carriers were annoyed by other platforms not playing with them nicely and basically just saying like, oh, we got the phones, we got the operating system, you just sell the phones. So Telefonica was, was the first partner that we had and it was hilarious because they built their first HTML5 application platform internally and then we released Firefox OS as an idea and the source code two days later and they're like, oh my god, that's so much better than the stuff that we did. So we're actually working with them through that. So all of the engineers came onto the project, got full-time allocation and work with them. We have an outreach team that talks to different providers, but we want to make sure that people, uh, that, that first of all, they can deliver. Like just saying, get your name on it and not bring out any phones is a problem to us. And also, uh, we don't want you to take over. We also say, this is an open operating system. We're not going to build a locked interface on top of that. Like most of our providers, there's a few legal issues still. Most of our providers, for example, sell the phones unlocked as well. So you can put their SIM card in, but any other SIM card as well. And um, so this is one way of doing it. They're mostly coming to us. Mobile World Congress, of course, is a big one where everybody is. So we're going to, I did 42 interviews last year in three days. So this is going to be the same thing there. We're going to meet a lot of people there. Originally, we had 18 partners, but a lot of them haven't delivered. So we just got down to seven now, and probably there will be a next swing this time. We also, this year, want to start publishing phones without a partner. Like, you can go in the shop and buy them. You can also buy, you can already buy e, uh, on, e, on eBay, you can already buy with uh, uh, Geek's phone in Spain, you can also buy phones already. And we want to make that, especially for the Indian market and the Bangladesh market, we just realized there's no point in trying a provider that people have to sign a 24-month contract to get a phone. So instead, we're going to build directly, work directly with hardware partners to get phones into the shops. So it's a process where they come to us, and as we were the only ones that were new on the market that were interesting enough, I wish there were more. I'm, I'm, I'm wishing Ubuntu, I'm wishing Tizen, I'm wishing Sailfish all the best in the world. Please, please do more open platforms. We need them. And we don't want to own that space. We just want to be the thorn in the side of the ones that make everything close. And we managed to prove that within two years. And I'm super excited about this. Because seeing an operating system come from an empty repository on GitHub to be released in 18, in 18 countries in two years is incredible. Good. Talk about great operating systems, let's go to Google Chrome. <laughs>